Uh, well, in our evening services uh, over the past five weeks, um, we've been looking at what we've called epic images uh, from the prophecy of Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel's a, a vast book, 48 chapters long. It's one of the longest books uh, in the Bible. And we've just, um, uh, in so many ways, just dipped into it uh, to look uh, at some of the, uh, the powerful and vivid imagery uh, that is set before us uh, in this Old Testament prophecy. Uh, we've gone through various um, images. Uh, in chapter one, we looked at that astonishing image of God, uh, which is full of motion and power, um, wheels and wings and all sorts of astonishing uh, imagery before us. Uh, then we looked at the, the, the quite shocking image of an abandoned baby um, in chapter 16. We then looked at the watchman, uh, speaking of uh, the responsibility of the, the, the prophet uh, and also the need to listen uh, to God's warnings. Then we came to the shepherd um, and chapter 34, uh, that remarkable chapter that, that, um, that rebukes the leadership of Israel and in response God says, I myself will be the shepherd. Then last week, um, I was away, but you were looking at the valley uh, of dry bones, uh, that remarkable chapter speaking of God breathing uh, new life uh, into deadness through word and spirit. Uh, tonight, we come to the final image, the new temple. I'm just going to read a couple of verses again from verse, chapter 43. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory, and the vision I saw was just like the vision I'd seen when he came to destroy the city, and just like the vision that I'd seen at the Kebar Canal, and I fell on my face, and the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. The Spirit lifted me up, and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Uh, the first five images that we looked at uh, are in many ways very vivid and powerful. This last one is maybe, maybe a wee bit different because it's perhaps a wee bit less exciting. Uh, if you read through Ezekiel, particularly if you read through the 30s, the the chapters 30 onwards. Uh, it's, it's dramatic, it's stunning, it's vivid. Uh, then you come to the 40s, and it's, it's maybe not quite so fast-paced. It can almost seem a little dry. Uh, reading through chapters 40 through to 48, there's, there's lots of measurements and uh, there's lots of descriptions of walls and rooms. There's lots of uh, duties explained, and in chapter 48, uh, there's a, one of these big long lists of names and tribes and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, it can almost seem a wee bit dry. But what I hope that we'll see together tonight is that the new temple is possibly the most epic image of them all. We're going to look at this uh, in many ways um, in terms of the big picture uh, of the whole imagery that the Bible gives us of the temple. And so while there's loads of detail uh, in chapters 40 through to 48 in Ezekiel and the passages that I've read uh, picked out some of these details, um, in many ways we're, we're, we're taking a wee bit of a step back from that uh, and we're looking uh, at the bigger picture. And I want us to start by just thinking about the story of the temple in the Old Testament, because that's a fascinating theme that runs through Scripture. And the key point that we must recognize is that the story of the temple begins at the very beginning, because the first temple is the Garden of Eden. Now, that's not explicitly stated when you read the descriptions of Eden. You, you won't see the word temple, but when you look a bit more closely, it becomes very clear that Eden was, in fact, a temple. Because if you ask the question, what is a temple? The answer is that a temple is a place where God dwells and where we can meet with Him 
and worship Him. And that is exactly what the Garden of Eden was. It was a place where God and humanity dwelt together. It's really fascinating that if you look back into Genesis chapter 3, uh, you'll see that it says that the Lord God walked in the garden. And then if you jump forward to Ezekiel, uh, no, to Leviticus uh, 26, when God is talking about making his, his sanctuary, his tabernacle, he says, I'll make my dwelling among you, my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you and will be your God. The same word, same idea, this idea of God and humanity being together. And it's actually a fascinating study to explore the similarities that exist between uh, the Garden of Eden and the later tabernacle and temple in the Old Testament. Um, a good place to go is Exodus chapter 25. There, God describes what his tabernacle is supposed to be like. And there's many similarities. There's cherubim, there's gold and precious stones. There's this lampstand that's shaped like a tree with branches and flowers. The same thing again is seen uh, in Solomon's temple. I'm going to read a few verses from 1 Kings and, and listen for the kind of garden language that, that is throughout this. Around all the walls of the house he carved engraved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. The floor of the house he overlaid with gold in the inner and outer rooms. For the entrance to the inner sanctuary he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and the doorposts were five-sided. He covered the two doors of olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He overlaid them with gold and spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. If you'd been able to walk into the temple, uh, it would have been full of, um, of echoes of Eden. Uh, with the garden imagery, with the gold, with the cherubim. And there are many, many more fascinating connections. Um, Eden was a temple. God was dwelling with humanity. So if you like, that's the kind of starting point of the story uh, of, of uh, the temple in the Old Testament. God and man um, dwelling together um, in a in a temple, in a garden. So what happens in the rest of the Old Testament? Well, there's various stages that we, we can go through. Uh, as I'm sure you know, um, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam sins, and the result of that is that he is driven out of the garden, driven out of God's presence, driven out of the temple. Genesis 3.24, he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword. In fact, there's another, uh, there's another similarity. Uh, again, um, when Ivor read, where was the gate? Which direction was it? It was east. And of course, the entrance to Eden was in the east as well. Another connection. Um, anyway, I'm getting distracted. Um, man was driven out um, and it's clear that now it's impossible for God and humanity to dwell together. Uh, so the relationship is severed, uh, and, and the temple access is completely restricted. And that's where humanity is left as a result of the fall. The next major temple moment um, in the Old Testament comes uh, at Mount Sinai, just after the Israelites have come out of Egypt. You'll remember that under Moses' leadership, uh, the people came out of Egypt, they were led through the wilderness, and came to Mount Sinai. And there, in Exodus chapter 19, we read that God's presence returned to earth again. I'm going to read some verses. I want you just to let the imagery, uh, let the description um, paint an image in your minds. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. The whole mountain trembled greatly, and as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up, and the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. 
Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the people, the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. Now, there is a temple moment because God himself came down to the top of that mountain and the whole emphasis is keep back. And so instead of walking with God like you have in the Garden of Eden, here you have this immensely strong emphasis on inaccessibility. The one thing you did not do before that smoking, shaking mountain, you did not go near it. And so you can see the problem and dilemma that exists. God wants to dwell among his people, but, but as a sinful people, that cannot happen. And, and there's this incompatibility between the holiness of God and the fallenness of humanity. But God's desire is still that he would be among his people. And so that brings us to the next stage of the temple story. God gives instructions to Moses to build a tabernacle. And he gives very specific instructions as to how that's to be built. That's really what the whole of the second half of Exodus is all about, chapter 25 right through to 40. That describes how it should be built. And then in the book of Leviticus, God gives very specific instructions regarding how he is to be approached. And the holiness of God, the seriousness of sin, means that, that an elaborate and complex sacrificial system is necessary if the people are going to be able to approach God. So instead of God being at the top of a mountain uh, like Sinai, God is now going to come right into the midst of the camp, but but the, the, the restrictions are still very, very high. And, and the instructions have to be followed with absolute precision. And when that tabernacle was made, God's presence came and filled that tabernacle. Exodus 40, 34, then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So if you just think about it, if you could, if you, um, could be a time traveler, um, uh, I know that's impossible, but just imagine that Back to the Future was true and you could jump into the car. And if you could go back to Eden and you would say, where's God? You'd say, well, he's in that garden. If you came to Sinai and said, where's God? You'd say, well, he's at the top of that mountain. If you could then come to the, to the camp and say, where's God? You'd say, he's in the middle of that tabernacle tent that's in the midst of our camp. That tabernacle was designed for traveling because the people were on the move. Eventually, when they had settled in the promised land, the tabernacle was replaced with a permanent temple built in Jerusalem. That was built by Solomon. It served the same purpose. And once again, God's presence was there. Second Chronicles 7, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. God dwelt there in the midst, right in the middle of the temple, in the holy of holies, among his people. But again, again, access was so restricted. The temple curtain kept people out. The sacrificial system made sure that, that access was very, very limited. And so you can see in terms of this story of the temple there's uh, an alienation between God and humanity created by sin. But in the Old Testament, the, the, the temple is functioning to go some way towards restoring that. It's not the same as Eden. It's not as good as it was. There are so many more restrictions and difficulties. But God's presence in his temple was a key part of the nation of Israel. It was a key privilege that they had. Um, it was it was a step towards solving the problem that sin had created. And that temple had a crucial function in the life of the people. It was, um, well, it was many things. I'm going to say that it was four things. It was a place of worship. 
There God was worshipped, their offerings were poured out, their thanksgiving was offered, their fellowship was shared. It was a place of worship. It was also a place of purity. And so whenever you read about the temple, whether it's in uh, Exodus or Leviticus or whatever, it, in, for the tabernacle or later on for the temple, there's this immensely strong emphasis on cleanliness and purity. Uh, the temple was a holy place. It was a place of purity. There was no casualness. Everything was kept pure. The temple was also a channel for mission. And that's a very important point uh, to emphasize. Um, when Israel had the privileged status of having God's temple in their capital at the center of their nation, that wasn't just for their benefit. It was to be a blessing and a light for all the nations of the world, fulfilling the promise that God gave to Abraham. Isaiah 56 speaks, to, uh, speaks of that. It says, the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to them, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and, not, and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house my temple, my house, shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Ultimately, it wasn't just for the Israelites. It was, it was pointing towards a mission to reach all nations. So, it was a place of worship, purity, mission, and fourthly, it was a place of community. When God said, I want to make a sanctuary, it was so that He might dwell in their midst. At the heart of the temple, was God's glorious presence among His united people. And so, if you can carry on in your, your time traveling, uh, and you were to come into Jerusalem in, say, the year uh, 930-ish, it would have been uh, BC, that is, um, and you said, where's God? They're appointed to the temple. He's in there. Israel enjoyed that extraordinary privileged status because they had the temple. But as is the case with all of Israelite history in the Old Testament, the story of the temple was one of failure. The people repeatedly turned away from God, and they continually rebelled against Him. And the eventual consequence of this was that they lost the temple and God withdrew His presence from among the people. And Ezekiel is the prophet that describes this moment. Chapter 10, 18 to 19, Ezekiel is seeing a vision. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out. With the wheels beside them, they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them. It's a description of the withdrawal of God's presence from the temple. And in the years when Ezekiel was a prophet, the Babylonians came, laid siege to Jerusalem, and eventually took the city, destroyed it, and destroyed the temple. God's presence was no longer among the people. And so, uh, we've got a, just a wee summary there for you as to what I've said. At Eden, God and humanity were together. The fall separated that. At Sinai, it comes a wee bit closer together. In the sanctuary, a wee bit more closer together. The temple, a wee bit more because it's a permanent place where God dwells. But the exile ends that. And God's presence is withdrawn. And the privileged status of Israel in terms of having the temple is shattered. Now, after the days of Ezekiel, when some people returned from exile to Jerusalem, they began to rebuild the temple. But it's interesting, in, in the prophecy of Haggai, we read a description of that, and it talks about uh, rebuilding the temple, and yet it says, 
Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Where did it all go wrong? Well, we said that the, the, the temple was, was four key things, a place of worship, purity, mission, and community. Israel failed in all four of these areas. In terms of worship, they turned from the living God and they went after idols, worshiping the gods of the nations around them. In terms of purity, they defiled themselves. Um, one of the passages, uh, I think it was 43, spoke a little bit about that, how uh, the people defiled themselves um, by turning away from God's law and uh, indulging in all sorts of immoral and sinful practices. In terms of mission, instead of uh, being a light to the nations around them, they had just become like the nations around them, and uh, they just wanted to conform to what other people were doing. And as a community, they were divided and broken. The nation um, disintegrated. The family of God, made up of this great structure of 12 tribes, ended up eventually at war with one another, alienated as a family, and separated from God. And as we've been saying, Ezekiel is kind of the, the, low, the low point of all of that. Um, we said maybe a couple of weeks ago that, that the history of, of, of the people of Israel in the Old Testament is a bit like the shape of a Nike tick. If you've got a pair of, pair of Nike shoes, you can look at them and see that it's kind of down, 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 down to the lowest point. And then it's a tiny wee upward bit at the end where people return from exile. But at the lowest point, you have the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple at the time of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel comes with a message of judgment because the people had abandoned God and walked away from their covenant relationship with him. But at the same time as bringing a message of judgment, he comes with a message of salvation and hope. Because although the people had abandoned God, he had not given up on them. And here in Ezekiel chapter 43 to 48, at the time when the temple lay as a pile of rubble, we have this description of a glorious new temple set before us. And as we read in chapter 43, once again, God's presence will fill this temple. That whole problem of the fact that God and humanity cannot dwell together is going to be solved. Although the physical temple in Jerusalem has fallen, God's plan is not over, and God and humanity are going to dwell together again. Now, it's very important to recognize a very small word right at the very start of the passages that we read. Uh, if you look at this passage on your bulletin, you can see in verse 2 that he, Ezekiel saw a vision and he saw something like a city. And the wee word like is so important because it's reminding us that what has been described before us here is not to be taken literally. It's not saying that, that, that the people should build a building uh, according to the outline and the measurements that's been set before us here in Ezekiel. In fact, uh, the emphasis is not that people build it. The emphasis is the fact that God has already built it. It's there. Um, it's not instructions for building. It's a description of something that has been divinely appointed. It's not a literal building that's been described. It's a symbol of something else. And it's telling us that God's plans for the temple are, are bigger than just a spectacular building in the middle of Jerusalem. And of course, the fulfillment of that does not lie in the return from exile. The fulfillment of that lies in the New Testament. And um, when you come to the New Testament, we see very quickly that at the heart of uh, Jesus' role, Jesus is many things, but one of the things that Jesus is, is a fulfillment of the temple prophecies in the Old Testament. So, you remember, uh, at the incarnation, when we think of Jesus uh, coming into the world, uh, in Matthew 1.23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name, what was it? 
Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's temple language. God dwelling among his people. And then there's another key verse in John 1, 14. It says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now remember, glory, that's a key temple concept, God's glory dwelling among the people. And hidden in that verse uh, is, is, is a, another um, crucial clue. When it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word dwelt literally means tabernacled among us again, temple language. Later on, Jesus himself says, destroy this temple. I will rebuild it in three days. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it in three days. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus is a fulfillment of these temple prophecies. Jesus is the presence and the glory of God among people. And so things are getting closer now Jesus comes and God walks among humanity again. He speaks to humanity. He's there right among the people. But it doesn't stop there because not only does Jesus bring God's presence to us in his own body, he also opens up full access to God. Remember when we said, spoke about Sinai and about the tabernacle and about the temple? On all of these things, there's like a massive no-entry sign from God. Access is absolutely restricted. Jesus transforms that. Through the cross, he opens up access to God. What happened when Jesus died? What happened to that big, uh, big curtain that effectively said no entry at the temple? It was torn in two, and access was opened up. Hebrews chapter 10 emphasizes that very powerfully. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Now, that to Old Testament ears is unthinkable to just walk into the holy place where God dwells, and yet we have confidence to do it by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So Jesus is coming into the world. God is among us. Through Jesus' death, access is being opened up through the cross. We're being brought closer and closer. But the question then arises, if you think of the narrative of redemptive history, at this point, Jesus returns to heaven. And so that key temple fulfillment where he's among us, he's, he's, he's gone again. And he's now back at the right hand of God. He's no longer there. So you ask, where is God's presence now? Well, here we come to the next key, key temple moment in the history of the Bible, the day of Pentecost. What happened on the day of Pentecost? God's Spirit, God's presence was poured out on all believers. And ever since then, whenever someone comes to faith, Jesus Christ, in, comes to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in your heart. And do you see what that means? It means that the presence of God is coming closer and closer and closer. He's now as close as possible to you as a believer because he's in your heart. God's presence, God's glory is dwelling in you. That's why Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple, and God's Spirit dwells in you? What we lost at Eden has been restored through Jesus. Back in Eden, Man was driven out of God's presence. Now, through Jesus, you are the very place of God's presence. That's why we can say when two or three are gathered, Jesus is there in their midst by His Spirit. And if you think about it, uh, God's presence throughout history has been in all these various geographical locations, Sinai, the sanctuary uh, as the camp moved, 
uh, in the temple in Palestine as Jesus himself walked along the shores of Galilee, in the midst of Jerusalem, in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the cross. God's special presence has been in all of these places, but do you know where God really wants to be? In your heart. That's how close he wants to be. And all of this, of course, is pointing forward to the new creation where we will dwell with God in perfect fellowship. Revelation 21 speaks of this. It says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And God's presence will be so complete, there's no need for a specific temple. As it says in Revelation 21, 22, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. God's great goal is that we will be with Him together forever. And you can see the story of the temple will be complete. And what we had in Eden will be both restored and, in fact, made even better. And one of the key implications for us to remember now is that God's temple is not uh, a place in Jerusalem. God's temple is not a church building like this. God's temple is you as the church. And when we talked about the temple, we said it was a place of worship, purity, mission, and community. If that was true of the temple in the Old Testament, boy, is it true of the church of Jesus Christ today. You are a place of worship. That's why we come together each week to worship. We live our lives as thank offerings. We identify ourselves as the worshipers of the God of the Bible. As God's temple, we are a place of purity. Now, I think that's a, a very, very important thing to remember. If, uh, if you look at all the descriptions of the temple um, throughout the Old Testament and in Ezekiel, you could perhaps read chapter 44. It speaks about uh, the purity and um, sacredness of that temple. It's a reminder that if you are a Christian, your heart is a very sacred place. When, when we sang, how lovely is thy dwelling place, you're singing about your heart. And that means we must guard our hearts. And that's why when Paul speaks about the church as God's temple, he uses that to emphasize ethical obligation. It's why he says, flee from sexual immorality. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Glorify God in your body. He says to keep away from idolatry, strife, enmity, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. These are all things that we should guard our hearts from because our heart is a special, sacred place. Instead, there should be something else coming out of our hearts. Remember we said the very first temple was a garden. What does a garden produce? It produces fruit. What does the Holy Spirit produce in our hearts? Fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. That's what we should display as a temple. You could have gone into the Old Testament temple and seen uh, sort of imagery of fruit and plants and flowers. Now, we want people to walk among the temple uh, church of Jesus Christ and see the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Our hearts are a place of purity. As God's temple, we are also a place of mission. Remember, the temple was God's great missionary tool. It was to be a light for the nations. And I think that this is emphasized very clearly by the passage that we read in Ezekiel 47. In Ezekiel 47, Ivor read out an astonishing description of a river. 
out of this temple that Ezekiel saw, there was a river flowing out of the temple, getting deeper and deeper and deeper, bigger and bigger and bigger. And the effect of that river was to bring life and healing to wherever it flowed, where you end up with this glorious picture of of, uh, trees growing and salty water becoming fresh again. And the key point there is that the river does not flow into the temple as though, as God's church, we're kind of sucking in stuff for our benefit. The river flows out for the benefit of others. The temple of God is His appointed means for reaching a lost world. That means that God's means for reaching the world is you. And you living your life as a servant of Jesus is that river flowing out from God's temple into the world, bringing hope and healing for the nations. I think that's maybe what Jesus meant, or certainly partly what he meant, when he said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's so interesting. When you think about Israel, uh, they looked at the nations around them, and they thought, we want to be like them. For us, we face exactly the same temptations. You look at your colleagues at work, you just do whatever. You look at peers at school. You look at people in the community living a a seemingly happy and godless life. And you think, oh, I just, sometimes I just want to be like the world. And we can end up following uh, people and becoming like the world around us. That's what the Israelites did. That's what I've done at times in my life. That's what we can so easily do. That image of a river healing the world as it flows out is a great reminder uh, that, that, that as God's missionary temple, we are not here to conform to the world. We are here to transform the world. And that's what the gospel message has done over the past 2,000 years. So we are a place of worship. We're a place of purity. We're a place of mission, and we are a place of community. Uh, When you go home, I want you to read the last four or five verses um, of Ezekiel 48, the last few verses of the chapter. And at the very end, a name is given to this great city, that uh, the city and temple that Ezekiel has has seen. Um, The name of that city is the Lord is there. And when we talk about community, that is actually what we're talking about. People together as God's family and the Lord himself is there. An amazing reminder that God's goal in having a temple, God's goal is togetherness. God just wants you with him forever. And that's what the temple is promising. And in many ways, I think this is bringing together all of our epic images. The awesome God of Ezekiel chapter 1 wants to be near to us. The abandoned baby is now the dwelling place of God. The watchman's work is done. The shepherd has rescued his flock. The dry bones have come to life. And forevermore, we are all going to be together with God. That's an epic image. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the promises of your word. And we pray, Lord, that we would all hear your voice calling us to faith in Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that it's only through faith in him that these blessings and privileges are ours. We thank you, Father, for your amazing determination to be with us.
and for us to be with you. And we pray that we would just never forget the depth of your commitment to us. And in the week ahead, we pray, O oh God, that we would live as your temple, as those who worship you, as those whose hearts and lives are ever more pure, as those who are committed to mission, and as those who stick together as your people. Amen.